Welcome to Second Take, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. The role of the private sector helping South Africa through its current electricity crisis is at last being more fully recognized. Terence Creamer joins me to discuss what business is and can do to help ease the constraints. Hi Terence. Hi. Would you say that the role that the private sector can play in easing the current electricity crisis is being more greatly acknowledged? Yes, I think uh, since the launch of the War Room in December by our Cabinet, um, there have been more engagements between ESKIM and the private sector using that framework. And we see now that there's actually a, a formal uh, working group that's been set up to try and look at how the private sector can play a role both on uh, reducing demand and dem demand side management programs as well as supply side interventions. So I think we've been through a period where there was some hope post-2008 where there was an electricity crisis committee and things were formed and there were plans to bring in private sector uh, in, in a bigger way. Um, and we did see it to a certain extent in the renewable energy space. But outside of that space, especially in the demand side management, things have gone sort of off the rails a little bit and we haven't really seen that uh, the reduction in demand that we were hoping for and we didn't see the programs materializing out of uh, some of those uh, strategies that emerged. Um, and so we're seeing that now being uh, re-energized, re-galvanized, and uh, formal processes, both in the form of discussions and uh, pr implementation plans, possible implementation plans being discussed, as well as um, through tenders that are starting to be released by the Department of Energy. And what are some of the key areas business can play a role in? Well, the supply side, there's immediate uh, um, RPP capacity, independent power producer capacity, that Eskom has to find money for to, you know, to re-engage in those contracts. So there's a, that immediate opportunity for the ones that are already available, as well as the municipal capacity that's available, to extend those contracts. So work is being done there to find a way, and that's mostly being done through a government ESKIM engagement uh, where they are seeking th 3 billion rand for uh, February and March to extend one of those contracts, those RPP contracts, municipal contracts, but probably most importantly to get the diesel that they need to run the open cycle gas turbines, which is a controversial point because it's so expensive to run those and ESKIM is running them for very much longer than those the three hours a day that they initially expected. They're running it for closer to 12 hours a day. But Eskom wants that money um, to provide that relief during February and March. Without that money, they don't have budget to buy diesel. And uh, we will not have the space for the maintenance programs that are underway, given the, the poor performance of the plant. So we will see a lot more load shedding during those months if that money doesn't come through. So that's an immediate thing. And I suppose in that space as well, the, the private sector, Chevron in particular, has to play a role in keeping those diesel plants wet in the sense that the logistics and the supply has to be there. Now there is some worry that the Chevron plant goes on an outage quite soon and that might coincide with the Kuburg outage in February uh, when we're going to see 900 megawatts going off from Eskom, which is going to make us increasingly vulnerable. But then there's the whole issue of uh, what the private sector, the private sector really builds the new power stations, Madupi, Kusili and Gula. Uh, and you know, really sticking to schedule, sticking to as much as possible, getting those pl uh, operations up and running. And then there's the private sector can play a role in the demand side management programs, which I think are a little bit off track. And we did see a request for information coming out from the DOE uh, in December to try and look at what sort of near term demand reduction programs can there be and uh, bring a lot of that uh, those programs and try to fund those programs as soon as possible so that we can start seeing a serious reduction in demand and also bringing in, say, uh, a cogeneration tender, which will also help on the supply side. And then really the big one is the uh, base load coal tender, which is for 1,600 megawatts. Now, this is a more of a medium term target because as we've seen with Madupi and Kusili, and hopefully we won't see repeated, but these projects take a long time to materialize. So we're looking for 1,600 megawatts that can be introduced only by 2021. Uh, but at least that is movement because we've had the determination for 2,500 megawatts released in December 2012. It's now 2015 and we're only seeing the tender coming out now, but 
by May, we should see the first expressions of interest from the private sector. They have to tell the DOE if they're willing to bid. And by June, the tender closes, and then we'll have a process towards financial close. There's con some concern as to why it's been limited to only 1,600 megawatts. Why, why doesn't it go? F why don't we go fully for the 2,500 megawatts? But at least I think everyone is welcoming some of the steps that are being taken to introduce not just renewable RPPs, but base load RPPs as well. And what are some of the constraints that the private sector faces? Well, I think there's still the policy regulatory uncertainties that face private sector uh, coming in to the electricity space. You know, the, 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 the fact that ESKIM is vertically integrated for some, it, it is a, 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 for some RPPs it is a problem because ultimately you're going to be you know, uh, battling with a sort of a player referee type situation where ESKIM is both the buyer as well as your competitor. So there is that longer term concern and we don't yet have certainty of, as to how that's going to be resolved. And in the context of the current you know, problems at Eskom, I think Eskom is really going to resist going through a massive restructuring or vertical separation at this stage. And while the, the whole uh, organization is being shaken up as it is, but we still need to get certainty around the policy environment and the, the framework. Then there's the, the price path. Is it sufficient to bring in IPPs? I think because we've seen such a steep rise in prices, there's much more appetite. But that's been a major constraint to investment by the private sector. It's, we've had a, a power price that's been too low for too long for the private sector to be attracted to it. But I think uh, the procurement programs are becoming more realistic in the prices that are being offered. And the competitive nature of those procurement programs also means that South Africa tries to get or does eke out the best deal they can. So it's just not one-way traffic of the private sector dictating the price. But I think still there's some regulatory concern, as well as, you know, can you provide power, what they call real power, to a non-ESCOM buyer, um, where ESCOM maybe can't take up the full capacity. So for instance, there's a procurement program for 1,600 megawatts. If the plant is bigger than the 600 megawatt cap that's been placed on it, how much can go across to a private sector uh, a buyer. So there's those things. And then I think the big worry, because we saw it with the renewable energy program last week, is the, the grid constraint. So we saw that the renewable energy program last year hit a wobbly and there was a delay to, there was an announcement of the preferred bidders, but a long delay to getting to financial close, mostly because of the connection concerns and whether Eskom can connect these projects to the, the grid. And that hasn't gone away, and that uh, relates somewhat to ESCOM's financial situation. And we need, again, some sort of certainty and maybe some sort of dialogue between the private sector, between government and ESCOM and the regulator to try and find out a way of how we can deal with this constraint, because it seems to be one that could be a major binding constraint for the introduction of RPPs. Thanks, Terence. Sure. That is the second take show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis.